And the Bible can be confusing to a lot of people sometimes because, for one thing, the last book of the Bible that was written most recently was 2,000 years ago. (laughs) Does anybody happen to know the oldest book in the Bible, what it is? It's not the first one. Anybody know what the oldest one is? Yeah, Job. Job is likely the oldest book. And that, Jesus was 2,000 years ago. Moses was 1,500 years before him. So that's 3,500 years ago. And Job was older than that. And it's still the best-selling book on earth. Amen. It's lasted all these centuries. And, but because it was half a world away where it was written, and 2,000 years ago, on top of that, there's a lot of things that are in the Bible that sound really weird unless you really study it and ministers are able to help explain that who have studied it themselves. Can you imagine if somebody 2,000 years from now read a statement in one of our books? People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks. Imagine what they'd think of that. Now, how many know what that means? If you got faults, don't go pointing out other people's faults. Now, if you were to tell somebody 2,000 years ago that the statement, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks, that means if you got faults, you shouldn't accuse anybody else of having them. They wouldn't hardly connect that together at all. <laughs> well, and there's things like that in the Bible. And do you ever read in the Bible about a ship and folks traveling in a ship? They had to fetch a compass. Does anybody know what that means, to fetch a compass? It didn't mean, okay, I don't know where north is. I better find a compass and find out where north is. That's not what it means. It means they had to go around the certain area. That's what they called fetching a compass. See how the culture back then was so different? way it is now, and uh, the many things like that. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, I could have even entitled this this morning, The Gospel Through Biblical Imagery, because I'm going to show you all the biblical imagery that is highly symbolic in the Word of God that you might have a hard time. Uh, for example, how many have ever read in Ezekiel chapter 1 that Ezekiel looked and out of the north there came a whirlwind? And there was creatures, and there was a wheel within a wheel, and there was fire enfolding itself, and there was beast carabims with the lion, the ox, an eagle, and the man on faces on each one of the four, and they had six wings, and two of them they used to fly, and two they covered their feet with, and two they covered their face with, and and uh, somebody in two thousand and uh, actually this was I remember back in nineteen seventies, that's a UFO. Alien life was coming to earth back in Ezekiel's day. No, it wasn't. (laughs) It's symbolic biblical imagery of things that actually go right back to the Garden of Eden. But I want you to look in John chapter 15 because we're going to minister about your victory stems from Jesus' resurrection. Say it with me. Your victory stems from Jesus' resurrection. And I use those words on purpose. John chapter 5 verse 15. Actually, I'm sorry, that 15, I got that backwards. We were out working yesterday and going up two flights of stairways. I think my brain's still tired this morning, (laughs) let alone my legs. (laughs) Sorry, John 15 and 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And, of course, we all understand the picture, and you keep on reading John, and he tells you this, where Jesus explained a branch can't do anything on its own. If it's not connected to the tree or the vine or the trunk, it's going to stay alone. There's not going to be any fruit grow. And he said our lives are like that. Without God, without Jesus... As far as God's concerned, we can't do anything that's worth really anything to Him. How many want to really do something for the Lord? Bring forth fruit for God. Make your life worth living. Only what's done for Jesus is ever going to last. 
People are focusing so much on the wealth of this world and materialism and the name among society, but when it's all said and done and they're buried and they've gone on to be with Jesus and meet him at the throne, only what's done for the Lord is going to last. And so it might be a sad story compared to the success they had down here. But Jesus Christ tells us that if we, like branches, are in him and that vine is in us, then so much, so much will be done. We'll bring forth much fruit. Now go to Revelation chapter 4. And here is a book full of biblical imagery. And I want to help explain some of it to you this morning. Revelation 4 verse 2. John was having visions all through what we read here. And in verse 2 said, Immediately I was in the Spirit... And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. A, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Does anybody know what color an emerald is? Green. It was a green, multifaceted, green-hued rainbow. It wasn't red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. It was green. And round about the throne, so picture this throne. There's a green-hued rainbow around it. And one was sitting on that throne. And also around the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And then out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunders and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And then he tells us that these seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. Now, how many know God, there's one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. God is just one. What is this? Seven spirits of God. In fact, this is what I'm going to focus on this morning. Seven spirits of God, it says. And before the throne, in front of it, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Now, in Old English, 1611 King James Version, that was like mirror. It was so still, it was like glass in a mirror. This body of ocean, this sea. And, and round about the throne... In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Remember I told you about Ezekiel seeing the wheel within the wheel? He saw the same faces, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. See how it's connecting? When you get to know your Bible, you start making these connections. Um... But verse 8 says, the four beasts, each of them had six wings about them. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. Now, I want to show you, and if you have your Bibles with you, keep your hand open to Revelation 4 and go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 25. I'm going to show you how the Bible corresponds with its, itself. Because when it comes to this kind of imagery, you might be scratching your head and saying, I can't understand. What is this? Why is there seven lamps of fire? Where, where are there beasts like this? And it, it would make, it cause confusion to you, really. But this is actually a picture of the Old Testament tabernacle. How many know what I mean about the Old Testament tabernacle? The, the, the mobile sanctuary that Moses commanded them to build in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt and were on their way to Canaan, where 40 years they would worship God at this tabernacle. And it says in Exodus 25, if you read it carefully, what is the first thing that God commanded them to make for that tabernacle in Exodus 25? Does anybody see it? What's the top of the list? He's telling them to bring an offering. They're going to build this tabernacle from the gold that they own, the silver, the brass, and then they had purple, scarlet, 
blue, fine linen, all of that would be material used. But go down to verse 10 and look at the first thing they're commanded to build. What is it? The Ark of the Covenant. And there's a, pic, there's a model of the Ark of the Covenant right here. And what is the first thing in Revelation that John saw in heaven? First thing he saw in chapter 4. Somebody say it. The throne, right? He said, I was, immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. Now, what is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant called? And if you keep reading Exodus, it tells you that. The mercy, what? Seat. Seat. Notice it's the mercy seat. The first thing God commanded them to build was the Ark of the Covenant where a mercy seat was. And the first thing John sees in heaven was a throne and God's sitting. One sat on the throne. Now, what's the second thing in Exodus 25? you got to go down a few verses. I'll see if you can catch it. That God commanded them to build after the Ark of the Covenant. Huh? No, there's no crown mentioned in Exodus. The mercy seat's part of the ark. But what's the next major piece of furniture totally apart from the Ark of the Covenant? Not quite. Almost there, though. But there's something before that. Verse 23. Look at verse 23. Thou shalt make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, a cubit and the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Overlay it with gold. And I actually have a model of that over there in my box of the tabernacle furniture. But it's the table of showbread. Now, what's the second thing John saw after the throne in Revelation? Verse 2 was the throne. Then he saw one sitting there. What was the second thing after that? Anybody catching it? You have to have your Bibles to find this out. <laughs> How many brought your Bible to church? What was round about the throne? 24 seats. Now, isn't it interesting? There's a table after the throne is mentioned, after the ark is mentioned with the mercy seat in Exodus. And then John sees the throne, and then he sees 24 seats. And there's a connection there, and you'll immediately see what I'm saying if we keep going with this. Back to Exodus. What's the third thing after the table? And yes, and that's what Robert mentioned in verse 31. Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. And here's a model of the candlestick. Notice, just like Exodus says, there's a shaft. There's a shaft up the middle. And then it says... There's branches, bowls, knops, and flowers shall be of the same. The six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, three bowls made like unto almonds, a knop and a flower in one branch, three bowls made like almonds, and so forth and so on. There's a pattern. Now, by the way, what kind of tree must that be shaped like with branches and a shaft? What did it just tell you what kind of tree that would be? Did it say, huh? Almond. It was an almond tree because it had almonds, materials shaped like almonds on it. And so back at, hold your hand there, what was the third thing John saw in Revelation chapter 4? After the 24 seats? Verse 5, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Isn't it amazing how it's lining up? Now, you might say, well, yeah, Mike, but in Revelation, it's seats, and in Exodus, it's a table. Well, usually tables are at, have seats, don't they? So you can see the... Now, back to Exodus. The fourth thing. You're going to have to go to the next chapter for this one. I'll give you a hint. Chapter 26. What's the fourth thing? No. 
if you go to chapter 26, there's curtains, and they're twined, lint, fine twined linen, blue, purple, scarlet, so forth. Curtains are here, curtains are there. And it talks about the loops. And then when you go down to verse 7, it says they cover the tabernacle. Verse 9 said they double the sixth curtain. And there's all numbered of curtains here. But when you go down to verse 31, related with the curtains, what is it? The veil. And how many have ever seen pictures of the veil? It says, make a veil of blue, purple, scarlet. Now you know why they had to offer those kind of colored cloths. And it says, carabims would be made in the veil. And you'll hang it upon four pillars. And, and it says in verse 33, thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So there's two rooms. There's a holy place and there's a most holy and the ark would go behind the veil into the most holy place. So it's like this veil was blocking people from the ark, right? Now watch this. This will bless you. In Revelation, the fourth thing, after we read about these seven lamps, something is blocking people to the throne like the veil blocked people from the ark. Verse 6, before the throne, what was there? A sea of glass. And then it said, what was around about the throne and in the midst of the throne associated with this sea? Four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And it, in verse 7 it says the beast was like a lion, an ox, an eagle, or a calf, and a man's face. And Exodus 25 says there was a veil blocking it with cherubims embroidered into the veil. And I don't have time this morning. I'll just spend too much time on this. But if you go to Ezekiel, like I just told you earlier, when it talks about the wheel within the wheel, it mentions the cherubims that were sewn into the veil, and they each had the face of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a man, just like John sees the sea, and then the beasts, like the lion, the ox, and the eagle, and the man. So what I'm trying to show you is that the tabernacle, and if I had a laser pointer, I need to get a laser pointer. I got, I got them at home, and I got to get some batteries for it. But on your far right, there's the Ark of the Covenant, and notice that big, thick, bold line. That's the veil. And it blocked that room called the Holiest of Holies from everything else outside of that. And on that thick veiled line that's there, you can't see it, of course, it's only indicated by a line, but there were carabines broidered into it. Like a barrier. If you saw a throne and you were John and you were in heaven and you were looking at that throne and then in front of that throne there was a sea. I mean, you have to walk on water to get across there. It's blocking you just like the veil. So isn't it wonderful that when Revelation gives us a vision of heaven, that thousands of years before that, when the tabernacle was made, that now we realize that tabernacle was like a model of heaven. In some way, that old structure Moses told them to build, it was literally like a heaven on earth. It was the model of what you see in Revelation. Isn't it wonderful that like they, that high priest could go into that holiest of holies, past the veil one time a year, and God's Spirit actually dwelt above that mercy seat and spoke. And there was sunlight in the outer court, the whole outer perimeter of that was the outside wide open air. But then when you went into that room where you could see the candlestick and, and where you can see a couple other altars and the table, by the way, at the bottom there, that's the table of showbread where the, I told you about the seats. The candlestick lit up the room in the holiest. But what do you think lit up the room in the holiest of holies where the ark was? It wasn't the sun. It wasn't the candlestick. It was the glory of God Almighty lighting that up. Praise God. And going into that, and according to Revelation, God was there sitting on that throne. And if you keep reading it, he shone like the sun. Praise God. And, and aren't you glad that that barrier, that veil, that represented this blocking us from getting to that throne in heaven in Revelation 1, what happened to it when Jesus died on the cross? 
It was ripped open. You know what God's trying to show us symbolically when that veil ripped open? He wasn't just showing us how bad the earthquake was when the earth rocked when Jesus died. Remember the, the, the rocks rent, but it also says the veil rent in the temple. And way yonder in the middle of the city where that, uh, actually the east of the city where the temple was, the veil ripped. And it didn't rip from the bottom to the top. The Bible distinctly tells you it ripped from the top to the bottom as though God himself was doing it. An earthquake couldn't do it that way. But that was telling us that we were blocked away from God and his throne. But through Jesus dying on the cross, do you get the message? The way's been opened up now. We can go to heaven. Oh, let's thank God right now that the way was opened up. If that tabernacle was a model of heaven on earth, and God had that veil rip where the throne represented was in the ark, then that represents heaven has been opened up for us. See what I mean now by the Bible's imagery preaching the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Now, no man could have thought this up. You get people reading Revelation, and there's all kinds of a million and one different interpretations of what that means, and somebody thinks he was high on mushrooms when he got those visions. That's what the world will tell you. Don't make it. I remember when I first started working on the radio station, they were talking about something that's confusing, and the boss said, yeah, that's as confusing as Bible prophecy. <laughs> but when you know your book, and you start, see, I started seeing that, and I said, I studied this for years and years now, and then when I started studying the tabernacle one day, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, look at the order that this is, made. the ark is first, and then that, and then, the, and then it's like the Lord touched my heart and said, look in Revelation. And wow, I saw it come together. But I want to focus with you this morning on that candlestick. Those seven spirits of God. What is that? The, they're mentioned again in Revelation 5. Very next chapter, verse 6. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts. I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 6 again. 5 and 6. I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne... And of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now, what did John the Baptist call Jesus when he came walking towards the Jordan River one day to be baptized? Behold, what? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, right? Well, John, in Revelation 5 and 6 sees a vision of an actual lamb, but this wasn't any normal lamb. I mean, look at the imagery here. That lamb was as it had been slain, but what do we read before it said he was a lamb slain? What's that five-letter word before a lamb as it had been slain? Stood. Everybody say stood. Now, if you get a lamb standing as it had been slain, what happened to that lamb? It had died and it resurrected. Can you see Jesus' resurrection here? You see how symbolism is preaching the gospel? And this lamb that was standing as it had been slain, it had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. That's what we just read in Revelation 4 and 5 about the seven lamps. They were the seven spirits of God. Now, instead of them being lamps, like on a candlestick, seven of them, and they're the seven spirits of God... It's now calling these seven eyes on the Lamb the seven spirits of God. But it adds something to it. It says it's not only these are the seven spirits of God, but they're sent into all the earth. And this might be a tough one, but does anybody know of a scripture in the Old Testament that talks about eyes, talks about sent into all the earth? Anybody in the New Testament church in John's day, those Jews knew the Old Testament like the backs of their hands. They would immediately recognize these things. We, we aren't educated as much as they were with the Old Testament. Sometimes the Old Testament to us, people don't even bring that to church. They just bring their New Testaments. And, and it takes teaching ministries. I, I've got mostly a teaching ministry. And we dig into this. Uh, did you ever see or hear the fivefold ministry? You've got the apostles like the thumb. You've got the finger of the prophet. 
You got the long one that's seen more than any of them, the evangelist. And then you got the ring finger, the pastor. And then you got the teacher. Digs into the areas where nobody else goes. <laughs> that's kind of what my ministry is. I get into those areas in the Bible there. And so here you've got seven spirits of God that go into all the earth. The eyes of the Lord. Does anybody know the verse I'm talking about? Huh? It's not surprising. It's, it's kind of an obscure one. Um, first of all, I'll, hold a, I'll make you think about that for a minute. Go to Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Keep in mind about the seven eyes, going to, the spirits of God going into all the earth. And way over in Isaiah 11, you've all heard this before. We've heard it sung. It's a great messianic prophecy of Jesus Christ to come one day. And it says in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod. Everybody say a rod. Out of the stem. Say stem of Jesse. And say a branch shall grow out of his, say roots. How many can see the tree language here? Now remember the candlestick? It's seven branches. And we're talking about the seven spirits of God that those lamps, seven lamps of God. And all of a sudden, way back in Isaiah, there's a rod coming out of a stem and, and there's a branch and there's roots. And then the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Say number one. Every time I read the word spirit of something, say a number, the following one. Number one, spirit of the Lord rests upon him. And the spirit of wisdom, say two. And understanding, three. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven spirits of God, right there. And it's talking about like a tree, a branch, a stem, a root, and all of that. And all of a sudden it mentions seven spirits. And what? This will really bless you. The stem had three branches on each side, right? But there was a shaft. The shaft is number one, the Spirit of God itself. Just the Spirit of God. But notice everything else mentioned is in three pairs. Look at how he words it. It said, first it said the spirit of the Lord. That's the shaft. But then it said the spirit of wisdom and understanding. There's one pair. And then it gives another pair. Spirit of counsel and might. Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Just like the candlestick has one shaft and then there's a pair. And then there's another pair. And then there's a third pair. That just blessed my soul so much when I saw that. There's no coincidence there. And who is this stem and who is this uh, uh, branch? How many know that's Jesus? Right? That's the prophecy of Jesus. And it says that these seven spirits, wisdom and understanding would be on him. Counsel, I just get shivers up my spine. Listen to this. Counsel and might would be on him. Knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And look what verse 3 says these things will do to him. They will make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, so forth and so on. But in other words... These seven spirits are going to enable him to judge proper, correct judgment. How many know that if you judge after your eyes, or if you judge after your ears, ears a lot of Pharisees might get by your test? Because Jesus said, you're so good on the outside. I hear you say all the right words. I see you do all the right things. But inside your dead men's bones... See, a person that judged after the sight in their ears would look at a Pharisee. He's great. My, that guy loves God. Look what he does. Listen to what he says. But Jesus doesn't judge after the eyes or the ears. He judges righteous judgment. In other words, he knows the heart of a person. Have you ever met somebody whose heart was wicked when you didn't know that and they looked so good? Aren't you glad you or I aren't going to judge the world? but God, Jesus is. 
Amen. And aren't you glad that when people might look at you and listen to you, they don't know what's really going on inside? But he does, and he's going to judge it. Oh, it's going to be a great awakening on a judgment day when a lot of people that look good to the eyes and they sounded good to the ears are going to be exposed for the wickedness inside. That's why some people, don't worry if people don't see your good works. Don't worry if they don't hear. you got something inside that God sees it. Praise God. And he's going to let all know one day. And on judgment day, you're going to see little old grandmothers that nobody ever knew that would pray and pray and pray in their homes. And they'd pray for their loved ones to get saved. They'd pray for the pastors and the churches. And they'd pray. And nobody ever knew their names. But I'll tell you, their names are going to be made wide known up in glory one day because he who doesn't judge after the eyes or after the ears sees the heart and judges righteous and is going to let the angels of creation know this was a powerhouse in my kingdom. Let's thank God for righteous judgment. Hallelujah. And in the actual Hebrew, when it uses the word stem and branch, it's indicating how many know what I mean by a shoot or a sucker. You know what that is? Some of you is? Exactly. That's why it's talking about the root of David. David was the greatest what in Israel? King. How many know... David's son Solomon then became king, and then it was like the golden age, and that's when the temple was built. But as the generations went down, it's the kingdom of David died. Mary was of the David's line, right? And Mary was so poor that when she took Jesus to, sell, to honor at the, because it was her firstborn at the temple, when he was eight days old and circumcised, that she couldn't bring the animal sacrifices. And the Old Testament says, but if you're poor, you can bring two turtle doves, pigeons. She brought the pigeons because she was that poor. This is David's family we're talking about. And that kingdom, it's like it had been a dead, decayed, decaying stump of an oak tree. But this prophecy said, from David, from that stump, from that decaying kingdom, he's going to come forth. It's going to grow all over again. Now, if this, my, I'm feeling the presence of God. How many can feel what I'm feeling? If this shoot or sucker is life from a dead stump, what's another word for life from death? Resurrection. Isn't that exactly what the cross is all about? Wasn't the lamb, as it had been slain, standing now? Can you see resurrection screaming at you from all of these scriptures? Praise God. And the wonderful thing is that when Jesus went to that cross, they were making fun of him when they put that crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe on him because purple was so expensive, only kings could afford it. And they were mocking him, saying, King of the Jews. But they didn't realize they were prophesying about him and didn't even know it. Because when he would die, he would die for all of our sins. And our sins which separated us from our God like the veil separated and blocked us because of our sins from the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. When he resurrected, or actually when he died, that veil ripped because he died for our sins. Our sins were the blocker. Our sins were the barrier. And it ripped because the barrier's gone now. Sins. And let me just throw this in here quick. Where's the first time you read of the cherubim that were embroidered into that veil? In the Garden of Eden, where man walked with God and fellowship with God. But sin happened when they disobeyed God. And God put him out the garden and at the east entrance to block him from getting back in where he used to be with God was cherubims. Just like the veil blocked people from the ark with cherubims embroidered in it. So now not only do we have the tabernacle as a model of heaven, but the Garden of Eden was actually another model. Some of you have heard us talk about this through the years. But it's been one of the most precious revelations the Lord ever gave me. And so if those barriers of cherubims were keeping man from the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword, 
and that was represented by the veil, and the veil ripped. Not only does the ripping of the veil say, we're going back to the throne of God now, but it's also saying, we're going back to the Garden of Eden, spiritually speaking, where Adam walked with God, where he talked with God. And as my wife was singing this morning, I come to the Garden alone. He walks with me. He talks with me. And remember what Brother Alfie said, or was it Brother Peter, when we were having the Resurrection Sunday? death, burial, and resurrection. What did Jesus appear like to Mary in the garden? A gardener. It's all over the place. It's talking about, wait, we're back again with what Adam lost. And not only that, heaven has got the same pattern. Heaven's opened up to us. And if you've got a pattern on earth, like heaven, and then it's just showing us what heaven's like in Revelation, it was really a heaven on earth in the Garden of Eden. Does anybody happen to know what Eden means in English? Isn't that what? Remember when Paul said about 14 years ago, I don't know if he was in the body or out of the body, but a man went into heaven. He went to the paradise of God, the third heaven. It called it. Remember, what did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? This day you will be with me? Woo! Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah! There it is everywhere. It's all, it's, it's talking about the cross. That's Jesus mentioned paradise on the cross. And then the veil ripped open that blocked us from paradise in Genesis. Oh, let's just thank God. Oh, hallelujah. This is just blesses me when I study the Bible and I see these things. Amen. And so that sucker, that shoot would come out. And, and, and there's the candlestick too, if you weren't able to see what I... Same model I've got here. Those seven spirits, the lamps. Watch this now. Now go to Revelation 1 again. Go to chapter 1. Chapter 1 now. And verse 12. Isn't the Bible like an adventure when God starts leading you and speaking to you? Revelation 1 and 12. I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned... I saw seven golden candlesticks. See, he saw it again. It was in chapter 4. Now he sees it in chapter 1. And then it says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, picture, there was one standing. Picture him just like this, like my finger standing in the middle of it. One was in the midst, like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Somebody say, Jesus. Jesus is in the middle. Now, doesn't my finger look like there's branches coming out the sides of it when I put it in the midst of the candlesticks? Didn't Jesus say, I am the vine, you are the branches? Look what verse 20 says about these candlesticks, what they symbolize. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So what's each one of those branches represent? A church. Churches are branches. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now what did chapter 4 call the fire on each one of those branches? The seven spirits of God. What were those seven eyes of Jesus called? The seven spirits of God. And it added, which go to and fro through the whole earth. And now the churches are connected to those seven spirits of God. How many can see what I'm saying? When you tie it all together, right? Well, there's, there's a reason for this. Both the candlesticks are the seven spirits and the churches are. Are the seven, that's what the churches are. How can the candlesticks be both the seven spirits of God and the seven churches? In chapter 1, it interprets the candlesticks as churches. In chapter 4, it interprets the candlesticks as seven spirits of God. How can they be both? Now, what were those seven spirits again? Remember, might, understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and all of that. Maybe you're starting to get it already. But those spirits were on Jesus and they made him of quick understanding. 
By the way, when Isaiah said, they'll make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, you know what the Hebrew also tells you? They'll make him sniff out the fear of the Lord. That's what the actual Hebrew means. That understand he will sniff out the fear of the Lord. How many know Jesus can sniff out who's got the fear of the Lord and who doesn't? Huh? How many know some people look like they got the fear of the Lord and sound like they got the fear of the Lord, but Jesus can sniff out hypocrisy because he knows their hearts. You and I, we can only see. But isn't it interesting that those seven spirits that are on Jesus, now the churches are involved as the branches. Could it be? When Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches, that that grace of God that's on him, that makes him of quick understanding, can be on us. And how many have ever had, I don't know just why. I haven't really known this person. They talk like a Christian. They sound like one. But I know they're real. It's like I can sniff out the fear of the Lord in them. That can happen because those same seven spirits on Jesus, it says, are on the seven churches of Revelation. We're churches. There's churches all through this world. More, a lot more than seven, but seven is God's perfect number. Somebody say amen. Right? We are united with Jesus, and these seven spirits that speak of God's spirit, his might, his wisdom, his understanding, it's given to us as well. He's the vine, we're the branches. And when you look at Isaiah 11, you read they make him of quick understanding and there's what it says. It means they, he smells out the fear of the Lord. He sniffs it out. He knows who has it and who doesn't. Now, here's the scripture I was telling you about. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. I showed it, I typed it all out because I don't want anyone to miss this. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Isn't that what Revelation 5 and 6 says? The eyes of the Lord are sent into all the earth. And it says, what do they look for? Why are these eyes of God going to, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is what? Perfect toward him. How many know if you get the fear of the Lord, your heart is perfect toward God? And he can smell it. He can sniff it out. He doesn't go by the eyes. He doesn't go by the ears. He can sniff it out in your spirit, according to the Hebrew. And God says, if your heart is perfect toward me, I'm looking for you. And I will find you. And when I find you, I will show myself strong on your behalf. How many ever needed God to show himself strong for you? Hallelujah. He will. But it's only if your heart's perfect toward him. He cannot help us. He says your sins separate from you and your God. So when our hearts are made right by the blood of Jesus and the cross, and he forgives us of our sins, if he didn't forgive us, he wouldn't be able to show himself strong for any of us. But I've been forgiven, I've been bought with a price, I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, and now I'm right with God, hallelujah, and God will see me when I need him to show himself strong for me, and those eyes will find me, and praise God, you can trust, like Iris was singing this morning, you can trust in that. You see, I'm preaching about how our victory stems from Jesus' resurrection. We need to learn this word more than what we know it. Why do we need to learn it? Because we need to learn things like this. Because lots of Christians, they, they don't have this knowledge and they don't realize, I'm connected to Jesus. His resurrection affects me. It actually gives me power. Those spirits that were on Jesus that made him all that quick understanding, that's for me too. And, and not only that, how many know we've got grace that an unbeliever doesn't have because their sins are separating them from God. He took my sins away. Did he take your sins away? Did he take your blockers from God's throne away? Why did God put those cherubims and the flaming sword in the garden? Why did he put a veil there blocking it? Because Adam and Eve sinned, didn't they? They sinned. And because of their sin, they were put out and blocked. So you could say the veil represents the penalty for our sin. We're blocked. But when Jesus forgives us, rip. 
He opens the way again. They're not blocking anymore. And my sins were taken away. This is the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. That's why it's all connected, all intertwined. Talk about fine twine, linen, veil. It's all finely twined together. All of these truths and all of this biblical imagery preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he's the Lamb that took away your sins? Oh, you see what's so beautiful in the Old Testament tabernacle where they had that ark and when they had literally had these things it was just Israel's sins that were taken away every year the high priest would take Israel's sins away but only for a year and they had to go through the whole ritual and sprinkle blood on the ark of the covenant next year to take that year's sins and then they had to do it again the next year but this man offered one sacrifice forever and sat down mercy seat. He sat down expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. All of those phrases start meaning more to you now when they were just words in Revelation. But it's all of a sudden it, it becomes alive. How many see the Bible coming alive when, when he starts showing us these things? And, but Jesus took away the sins of the world, not just Israel, for all time, not just once a year. He deserves another applause. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You see, you need to learn that. I've got victory. Now, let me show you something else here. Number 17, verse 2. Way back. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. 17, verse 2. God told Moses these words. Speak unto the children of Israel. Take every one of them a rod. Where did we read that before? There shall come forth a rod. Everybody take a rod. According to the house of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, how many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. And write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And I want you to take those rods and lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony. The Ark of the Covenant was also called the Ark of the Testimony. A covenant is a testimony. Lay them up before the Ark. Somebody say, in the holiest of holies. Somebody say, past the veil. Oh, can you see something building up here? Jesus is that rod. Went into the holiest. Keep reading. Lay them up where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake to them, told them to do that. In verse 7, he lays up the rods in the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And in verse 8, it comes to pass that on the morrow. Somebody say, after the night. How many know something happened on the morning after Jesus was in that tomb for three days? Huh? In the morning, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded. Have you ever seen trees with buds on them? You don't see the flowers when you see the buds, do you? You don't see the fruit when you see the buds, do you? Well, this tree you did. Because it wasn't only budded, it brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded what? Fruit. And what was the fruit? Almonds. What kind of tree did they make that fashion like? Almonds. So here you got the rod of Aaron with buds and fruit, almonds and flowers at the same time. Nature can't do that. If there was a, a botanist amongst the tribes of Israel, he faked that. He's of the tribe of Levi. So he got his rod, brother Aaron's rod and he found himself a, a branch and had blossoms on it. And he put it in there overnight because we weren't there. We didn't see it. But God knew they might do something like that. So he says, oh yeah, you just check that rod more carefully. Notice there's real buds on there. We don't get crazy glue out in the wilderness. We didn't find any buds to glue on there. Notice at the same time there's buds, there's flowers, 
That's impossible for nature. And notice at the same time, there's almonds. You've got the three stages of growth that can't happen at the same time at nature, happening at the same time on this rod, proving Moses didn't fake anything. Because, folks, that's not normal life. That's resurrection life. And how do I know it's resurrection life? That stick was a dead branch. That stick was a dead stick. It wasn't in the ground. They'd been using it as canes, rods, and walking staffs. And they took a dead stick and put it in there and called it a rod, just like Jesus was prophesied to be a rod and the stem of Jesse from his roots. And that dead stick came to life again. Somebody say resurrection life. There it is again. And it had at the same time buds, flowers, and fruit. And now there it is. All the, you could see the almonds. You could see the flowers and the buds if you look carefully. And how many know? What, what office did Aaron have? What did this prove he was going to do for a living? High priest. Everybody say high priest. High priest. How many know Jesus is our high priest? That is God. Isn't this amazing? phone here now and so now let me close with this go to Exodus 25 again where we read about the candlestick Exodus 25 somebody say the symbols are preaching the gospel in Exodus 25 and 31 hallelujah thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold beaten work, his shaft, his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers. Did you catch that? What are the bowls? The bowls in verse 33, the bowls are like almonds. So you got the almonds, the knops are like buds, and you got the flowers at the same time shown on this replica of an almond tree just like the rod of Aaron was an almond branch and had buds, flowers, and almonds at the same time. Can you see the similarity between the rod of Aaron and the seven golden candlesticks? How many remember when Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, right? Alone. But if it dies, what does it bring forth? Much fruit. Hello, fruit. Hello, branches. You came up with the resurrection tree. (laughs) You came up with the resurrection tree. You're a branch now. It wasn't until Jesus came out of that grave after he died on the cross that he became king of kings and lord of lords. And David's kingdom was like a sucker and a shoot coming up out of a decayed stump but it would grow into a kingdom with much fruit greater than David ever could imagine, greater than Solomon ever knew. Aren't you glad that the kingdom now has been over 2,000 years and Jesus is still king of kings? He's still Lord of lords and he's coming back again and if the world hasn't seen the kingdom yet and I've seen it, how many have seen the kingdom? It's going to see it, hallelujah, because when he bursts the eastern sky and comes out of the heavens in the clouds, the same way he went in up in Acts 1 and 11, he's coming back again. And he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords for everybody, forevermore. And if your knee hasn't bowed now, one day every knee's going to bow. Aren't you glad you bowed your knee already? Aren't you glad you already confessed he's Lord? Because one day he's going to make Satan. He's going to make every demon. He's going to make every sinner bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Woo! Oh, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Somebody say I'm in the kingdom. Let's all stand as my wife comes back to the keyboard right now. Oh, can you see the God?